All right, cool. Um, we're gonna get started. Uh, so great seeing that five people showed up. So yeah, this will be an information session. Um, it's gonna be split into two parts. Uh, Jacob will do the Wireshark presentation first, and then I'll do go over GDB. Um, the GDB is gonna be focused primarily on assignment six, and hopefully it should help you with in-class CTF. I don't know, I haven't seen it yet. So yeah, uh, Jacob, you wanna get started? Yeah, all right, let me, can everyone hear me all right? Okay, let me share my screen. All right. Okay. Yeah, so for the first part of this uh, presentation, we're going to go over uh, Wireshark and some things that will be helpful to you for um, both the CTF and Assignment 6. So, okay. So, yeah, so over, first we're going to go over a uh, brief network review, some basic concepts that you've already seen in class um, that you should uh, definitely be aware of. Um, we're also going to look at, again, a review of the difference between TCP and UDP. And then we're going to look at PCAP files, um, which we'll get into in a minute. Okay, so the um, requirements, if you want to follow along with the demo we're going to do in a little bit, is just going to be you need to have Wireshark uh, downloaded and installed. Um, and then also, you'll need to have the uh, PCAP files that uh, were linked on the Piazza post as well. All right, so what we're going to learn, again, uh, we're going to go over some basic networking concepts, um, Wireshark and reading PCAPs. So what is Wireshark? Um, Wireshark is a uh, powerful packet analyzer tool, um, and it can serve a variety of different purposes. So some of the uh, different purposes in, would include um, network troubleshooting. So you can um, look at network traffic in, in order to identify and uh, solve different problems that you might be uh, experiencing with your network or something like that. And then as well, um, you can do just a general analysis on networks and um, it can also be used as a tool to help you um, develop uh, different protocols that you might be working on. And so Wireshark is very, I don't know, tell me you might have used TCP dump before. Um, it's very similar. It offers similar functionality. It's just uh, much easier to use. So why Wireshark? Well, it's, uh, it offers the ability to analyze traffic in real time. And so because of this feature um, and how easy it is to use, it's really become the industry standard. Um, Wireshark is available. Uh, across all different operating systems, and it's free for everyone to use. Okay, so if you recall, you went over this in class, I believe, the OSI model. Um, so when we refer to packets, you can't um, just talk about uh, data in general. Um, so you can't expect people to know uh, what that you're talking about packets specifically because there are many types of many different types of data that are uh, involved in the OSI model. So um, if you want to learn more about this, it's a good thing to know. You can look it up and uh, learn more about this model. Okay, so again, I, you guys have uh, gone over this in, in lecture. Um, it's a very important concept. So make sure you know the difference between TCP and UDP. So uh, and basically, TCP, you want to remember the three-way handshake, the SYN, SYN, ACK, ACK. Um, TCP really is focused on air checking, making sure that the packets are actually delivered. Um, so that's why it's good for things where you need to know um, if the message is like email, if the message has been sent to web, if uh, you've actually loaded the web page, stuff like that. And then so UDP is more of a, uh, it's not really focused on air checking. Um, so with UDP, it's more, you can remember it as fire and forget you're sending the packets and basically forgetting you ever sent them because you don't care if they're really delivered. Um, so it's good for things like video, video chatting and voice calling.
Okay, so capturing packets uh, refers to the act of um, capturing network traffic either over Wi-Fi or Ethernet. Um, so since Wi-Fi is really just um, a radio frequency band, uh, anyone within the range of that Wi-Fi signal can uh, capture its packets uh, without even having to be logged in or anything like that. Um, so this little device uh, on the right there is called uh, Ponagachi, and it is made from a uh, Raspberry Pi and some other components. And really its function is to uh, capture Wi-Fi packets and we'll capture Wi-Fi packets and the handshakes, which are, the handshakes are what, um, so if you have like your phone or a PC uh, connecting to a Wi-Fi network, the handshake is a process that allows uh, devices to connect to a Wi-Fi network. Um, so these uh, devices can actually um, look at the handshakes and then use uh, some password cracking tool to try to um, steal the uh, Wi-Fi password so that you can log into that network. So you've heard me, you've heard me talk about a uh, PCAP. So basically, um, PCAP is short for packet capture. Um, it, uh, it basically, a PCAP file is just a file containing uh, the TCP, UDP, IP packets that have been captured from a network. So if you run Wireshark to capture packets, what you're going to get uh, when you're done capturing packets is a uh, PCAP file. Okay, yeah, like I was just talking about, um, capturing packets or sniffing on Wireshark. So if you have the program installed, you can do this by clicking um, this button right up here and that'll start capturing the packets for you. Um, we're not going to go over this specifically in the demo, um, but you can definitely try it out at home, look up how to do it. It's not too hard at all. Okay, so this is the basic uh, layout you're gonna see when you open up Wireshark. You're gonna have uh, up at the top here, it'll show you all the different categories and this is customizable. So you can see um, like your source IP, source port, all that kind of stuff. And then yeah. top you got your, you have your toolbar, um, much different functions like this one, capture packets, stop capturing, you can search through the packets, all that kind of stuff. And then each one of these is an individual packet. Oh, sorry. So yeah, each one of these listed here is an individual packet. So you can cl click on these. And once you do that, you'll see all the data about the packet down here. And then the actual hexadecimal, which is uh, converted to ASCII for you on this lower portion. So this is a scenario we're going to use uh, for the demo we're about to do. Um, so imagine you're a student. Uh, sniffing Wi-Fi packets at the Starbucks and the MU uh, just because you're bored. Um, you isolate the packets into a PCAP file like we talked about and name it mysite.pcap. Um, so you were assuming that uh, students are attempting to log into their new website that they've created uh, with their credentials that are sent in plain text and you hope to um, be able to log into that website and cache in before they uh, offer their uh, initial public offering up here. And uh, just a disclaimer, it actually uh, is against ASU's rules to, um, to do this, to uh, analyze network traffic and look for passwords, so don't actually do it. Okay, so uh, if you don't know what the post method is, it's uh, basically what um, is used to send data from, I guess, a client or, um, a website over to a server and it's a request that asks the server to um, store that data. So it is, if you don't use a SSL certificate on your website, which uh, was also something uh, Professor Dupay went over in lecture, um, your this post uh, request will not be encrypted at all. It's just spent as a regular HTTP request. Um, so that's why you definitely need to use uh, HTTPS so it is encrypted and no one can the uh, user information and passwords like we're about to do. So get into the demo. So once you have Wireshark open, you can um, select your PCAP file open or you can just drag it in, but I'll just do it this way. 
it's called my site. Okay, then here you see you have all the packets from that file listed here for you. Um, so then the first method that we're going to use in order to find that uh, post request, which is sending the uh, user login information to the server, is we're going to apply uh, a filter here. So the filter we're going to apply is the HTTP, oh, right there, let's use post. So you enter that in, search for it, and you get uh, two packets here. So each one of these is a uh, post request. So you click on that, see all the information here. And here's the actual data within the packet. So you look through here, you can find what was be, what was being sent. Uh, so we scroll through, look through, and you see down at the bottom here, you have user, Billy, and then his password, right here is incorrect password. So we can we were able to see this now because this is just an HTTP um, request, not a HTTPS. If this was HTTPS, this would all be encrypted and you wouldn't be able to read this. Similarly, we have another um, post request here. We scroll to the bottom again. You can see this time the user is uh, an admin and logging in with this password. So, so then another way we can uh, filter through these packets and try to find passwords is to um, search through, go up to the search bar and do a regular expression search. So you'll have to click the search bar, click the search button, I mean, and then uh, select regular expression from the drop down and enter in, you know, the expression you search for. In this case, we're searching for passwords. So password and find. You see here, this time there's a lot of different uh, packets that come up when you do that search. But we're looking for a post request. So you can read through this little menu and try to find anything that has a post request. So you see, we missed one. Yep, it's right here, 48, same one we were on. You can see it's that same packet with the admin and the password for the admin. So that's really the demo for Wireshark that we're going to go over. I mean, obviously, there's a lot more you can do with it, but for right now, this is really all you need to know about Wireshark and how to use. Yeah, and then all that, all what we just did is on the slides right here. So if you want to do it yourself and you weren't flying along, you can do that later. And so what did we just learn? Just basics, how to use Wireshark, how to import PCAP files, um, how to search through the different packets and find what you're looking for. Um, I don't know, if anyone has any questions, you can ask now about Wireshark and wait till later when uh, Gabe's done with his presentation. Actually, uh, ask about the Wireshark questions now. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it, as you can see, it's just really fast. Most of it is pretty self-explanatory. Um, and it will help you with the assignment six if you understand what we just did. So anyone have questions? Yeah, actually, um, so the PCAP file that we would be finding in, what is it, um, get password uh, part in the assignment, is that, like how would we recognize that it is a PCAP file? Is it just like the file extension or? Uh, yeah, yes. A, Have you actually logged on to check out the assignment? Yeah, so I logged in and I like grabbed the file, but of course it's all encoded and I was having a hard time with the command to put it on my own server anyway. So um, I think that's what I was having yes. a problem with. So this uh, PCAP file it actually is just uh, .pcap. It's a file extension. Right here. Okay. Yeah, but the thing with, you got to remember with uh, file extensions is I always I hammer this at my office hours. I think a lot of people who show up are kind of sick of it. File extensions don't doesn't actually mean anything. It like right, right. So it yeah, I'm trying. I'm actually logging on to this um, CTS server right now to check. Um, our challenges, and then it's the find pass.
Right. So in the assignment, I think I think it's um it's actually just called network trace. And you can use it, you can use like Wireshark or you can use the other tool we were talking about earlier. What oh am I still muted? Oh, okay. That was there, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so you can use Wireshark or the other tool you was talking about. Um, TCP dump. Yeah, TCP dump to look through, to skim through it. Um, it's just called network trace, but it just goes back to like file extensions doesn't really mean anything. So like you can, if you see network, most likely it's probably a PCAP and you could probably use Wireshark to read it. And then, so that's why he uh, recommended you learn um, SCP, which is secure copy to copy it to your local machine. Okay. Is there any other any other questions? Uh, right. sorry, did, sorry, did that actually answer your question or? Yeah, for the most part, I just figure out I need to figure out how to use the SCP correctly because it just wasn't recognizing my local like domain name, I guess. Okay, it's usually SCP is a lot easier if you do it from your local machine and do a request to the server than the other way around. Just because like your own computer has like firewalls and stuff that prevents stuff from being sent to it. So it's a lot easier oh. to like do a pull request than it is to do a push request from the server. Okay, okay. got it. All right, cool. Thank you. All right, cool. Okay, so now we're going to move on to... Uh, wait, anyone have any final Wireshark questions before we move on to... GDB because this one's a little more complicated. Um, also, disclaimer: like we're the stuff I'm gonna go over is like ahead in lecture, but it will help you a lot in assignment six. So that's why I want to go through it now, so you guys have like plenty of time to like actually understand the concepts and stuff. All right, cool. Okay, so I shall share my screen. Yeah, we'll present. Uh, so once again, I'm Gabe, um, and you guys know Jacob. So overview, we're going over GDB, <laughs> some common commands, and then we're going to go over the stack, which you guys went over in lecture. Uh, and then we're going to actually learn like what a buffer overflow is, and then why we're learning, why we're still learning a buffer overflow. Like the vulnerability has been around since the 70s. OK, uh, so for this one, it, a lot of people keep get like a lot of people get around the whole like Linux machine requirement, but this is actually going to matter. Um, the server is using Ubuntu 1804. You can use basically any other Linux distribution, but uh, but yeah, I'll I'll get into why it actually does matter that you do use a Linux machine this time. So GDB is just the GNU debugger. It's portable. It helps analyze like your program. Uh, execution so like if you guys are taking csc 340 this is a really helpful tool just so you can see where your program like dies um so once again the presentations were focused for the ctf and assignment six not so much in programming and stuff but it it's it can be used in like programming so the reason why you need a legs machine is because we're analyzing 32-bit um we're analyzing 32-bit executable like binaries so certain computers won't be able to analyze it. Just like, if you try on a Mac, you'll get these errors where like you get the kernel failure or you get an executable format error just because like my Mac can't read this 32-bit binary, it's too old. So that's why um, you do need to actually have like a Linux machine. And then us check chat. What can we use? Uh, what can we use for non-Linux machines then? Um, you. Well, because Windows has the Ubuntu subsystem, and then you could just install a virtual machine, which what I have right now. So this is just a Ubuntu server, and then I just like SSH into it. Uh, but like the assignment six, you're on a Linux server, so like you don't have to worry about it for assignment six. But if you want to practice this stuff on your own, you're gonna. I highly recommend using an Ubuntu, like a Linux machine, like virtual machine, just because. It just makes it a little easier. Oh. Uh, OK, so if you want to follow along, you already, they, I already posted the downloads. We're going over uh, Pico CTF 2018 Buffer Flow Zero. It's a really easy challenge. It's, it's supposed to be like the easiest, easier challenge. And I actually added comments to the code on that just so that we could speed up the learning process. OK, so loading programs in GDB, you're like, 
how like everything's going to be command line based. There's no GUI. So you're going to have like, that's why we've been hammering. Like that's why professor DB has been hammering bandit and stuff just because to get you comfortable with the command line. So it's pretty easy. So you have your, um, vuln executable or, and then you would just do the GDB command and then vuln and then GDB is built into most Linux distributions. So like you shouldn't have to download anything and then make sure you target the executable, not the source code. Uh, so the, the first command and easiest one is just R, which is run. Obviously, like you just have to run the program itself. And then, uh, so on assignment six, the program is going to set the command line arguments, just like the same challenge that we're going to go through. So as you can see, like I just do run and then like five A's and it looks like the program just takes in these five A's and prints it back out. So very similar to your assignment one, where you just say command line argument and it just spits out the standard output. Uh, and then what else can you do with GDB? Well, you could disassemble, which is one of the big ones we're going to be doing. We could set breakpoints. So like you could set breakpoints at certain addresses in your program to see like if your program crashes before that breakpoint. It's really useful in debugging. And then there's stepping, which is like going line by line in, down your code. And that's why it's like a good um, debugger. So you would just use the disass command. And then so this is what it looks like. So obviously every... C program has a main function somewhere. So just ask main is usually like pretty easy to do. So like, and then you always get the x86 assembly for it. Uh, don't worry, I don't know everything that's going on either. And to be honest, you don't actually have to for this. You just need to focus on the certain registers we care about. And we'll go over that in a little bit. And then there's the breakpoints, which I just talked about. Like you can set certain breakpoints into your program, run it, and then see like where it dies. It's really useful for 340. Like it'll save you a ton of time than trying to do a bunch of print statements, trying to figure out where your program dies or doesn't work. And then there's stepping, which is like, you just go line, like next instruction, like instruction by instruction. And so like, so you can see like where your program dies or like if it's actually jumping to functions when it's supposed to and stuff like that. All right, so we're gonna look at the code. So, let's see. So this is the uh, code I posted, and I actually added a lot of comments to it just to make it like easy to read. So here's main. Um, we really don't care about that stuff because we already have the flag. It's just a text file, and then this just reads that text file. So if anyone who didn't download what I'm talking about, I'll just pull it up. So I have, so what I posted was this GDB exercise and then there's this vuln.c, which is the code we're looking at, the flag.text, which is like what it's reading to s simulate. So the flag is just like a simulation to prove that you successfully exploited what you're supposed to. It's, it's just a, a way to like say, oh, I actually was able to pull off a buffer overflow. Um, and the, the reason we use this is just because it, it just gives you feedback that like, hey, you actually did it. Uh, so that's what we're going to be doing on Thursday in, for the in-class CTF and very similar to your assignment six. And then you have the vuln executable that, or the, yeah, or the binary. So the thing with this is do not recompile this program on your own machine because like when they created this, there's a bunch of stuff that prevents buffer overflows. Like there's like canaries and a, like ASLR and a bunch of other tools and stuff that prevents like above overflow, but because we're just learning, the binary executable they give you is like, it's vulnerable on purpose so that you can actually practice and learn from it. So don't do like GCC and I'll put this vuln.c yourself. Like it's just gonna mess it up. Like you're not gonna be able to actually pull it off. Um, okay, so anyways, going, moving on. So the, this is the important lines is, uh, so this one, which is vuln argv. So you guys don't remember argv and c is just the argument vector, which is whatever the command, the arguments are after you do like command line, like when you run your program, there's like arguments afterwards. And so it calls this vuln right here, vuln functions. And then this is like what the buffer is, in buffer overflow. And then, so that line's actually we care about. And then this line is what we care about too. It's a signal, uh, this um, signal thing. And it basically just says like, if the program seg faults, it's gonna call this signal sys v handler and that just prints out the flag. So essentially all this program is asking you to do is call a seg fault and you win. 
and like I said, there's a really pretty easy assignment, or I mean, there's a pretty easy challenge. And I'm just, we're using this one as an example to teach you guys like a buffer overflow and how to help you on the two challenges for assignment six. So this is just re reiterates like the important parts. So we only care about that portion. Don't worry about that, that portion, and that line 46, like because your, your arg b is getting passed into this vuln function. And then there's this character buffer and then string copy. Uh, the string, the, the reason why this is a vulnerable buffer overflow is because of that string copy function. And we'll go into that later. So real fast, we have to understand the stack, which we just went over in lecture. So I'm trying to go through this real fast unless you guys have questions or need me to slow down. So just remember the stack, when he says that it starts from high address and builds down. So what he means like it builds down is it grows down towards the lower addresses. And then like you got your um, shared libraries or unused memory and then your heap that grows up and then some other data stuff. But for this class, uh, you're, you don't only need to worry about the stack. So don't, you don't have to worry about heaps and stuff. That's like later more advanced stuff if you really find this interesting. So uh, the stack is built into stacked frames. And then, so this is the thing I was talking about earlier, but like, I guess he's six is boring, but we really, really care about certain um, registers. So the ESB is like one of the registers we actually do care about. And so like these stacked frames are like separate like this, where you have your stack pointer, some buffer space, your base pointer, and your instruction pointer. And that buffer space is actually like that character um, back in the code, like the actual like character buffer, because it's a gap in memory that you get to use. And that's why a buffer overflow is so, such a big issue. So the EIP is what one of the registers we care about is because it is, <coughs> sorry about that. So it's, Awesome because it is the register that control that points to the next instruction. So like if you can control the the EIP, then you basically get to control the program. It's that, it's really cool. Uh, so move on. So like once again, the register we only, we care about is the EIP. And then so basically, what a buffer overflow is we're doing is we're gonna be writing a bunch of like gibberish. In this case, we're just gonna use capital A, and you're writing a bunch of gibberish to fill the buffer space, overwrite the the base pointer and then into the EIP. And once you overwrite the EIP, now you get to control the program. And that's like the big picture. So you might ask me, why do we use capital A? Well, capital A is just easy to read because in ASCII to hex is just represented by the number 41. And the command I'm gonna be using to print A's just so we can specify the amount of A's that we're passing into our program is Python dash C print A times 17. And then it prints 17 A's for you and then you can just copy and paste it over. So we're good. So for this one, uh, I was gonna do a live demo, but I decided that I think this is easier to explain. So like this one, you just, we're just gonna do 20 A's just because, well, uh, the buffer here is 16, right? So like, let's, if we overwrite the 16, maybe we could continue and move on. So we do the 20 A's and no seg fault happens. So that means we didn't win, which is really, is interesting, right? Because you would think that you passed the 16 bytes that is in the buffer. Um, so next we're gonna do uh, um, 26 A's and we're gonna use the info registers command in GDB. So as you can see, we caused the seg fault, which is what we want, because that's all the program says we need to do. and then. You notice here when you type, so on GDB, you could type, um, oh, did I not put it? Oh, info registers in GDB, and you could see all the registers. So like you could see EBP, so like BP is just base pointer. You notice that it's getting written by 4141. And then, so if you remember earlier, capital A is 4141, it's 41. So that means that the A's that you're throwing into the program is actually getting into the base pointer right now. And it's like, it's like leaking into that register. So let's try 28 A's. And then you see that 28 A's actually gets you the flag, meaning that you won. Like you caused the seg fault and you're able to get that flag. And so let, if we look at it in GDB, you can see that the base pointer is getting overwritten by A's, as you can see with the 41, 41, 41. So that's enough for this challenge. 
But for your homework assignment, you're going to need to overwrite the instruction pointer. Or, yeah, yeah, yes, <laughs> uh, yeah, instruction pointer. So we're gonna keep moving on. So like this one, I'm putting 30 A's into the program. And then once again, you run a GDB, you do info registers, and you can see that the instruction pointer now has 4141 right here. So that means like your A's are slowly creeping into that instruction pointer. And if you remember earlier, we want to overwrite the whole thing. So yeah, we got the flag and we won, but you still haven't written, overwritten the EIP, which you're gonna need to do for assignment six. So we just tried 32 A's and then eventually we overwrite it like so. So now you see all the four ones. So that's why we just use capital A. It's just an easy way to find out um, like if you're actually overwriting these registers like you're supposed to. And then you could see like up here for the base pointer, it's also getting written about by capital A's. So like tips for assignment six. Oh, sorry, I got a question on chat. How do we know where that function was? Um, can you, uh, which one, main or vuln function? Skylar, how do we do, oh, vuln. Oh, um, it's, because it just printed out the flag, like Pico CTF sample flag. So if you, so like this is the text file. And then like, if you look at the program, it just, if you cause a seg fault, it reads the flag and says like you won. Okay, uh, do you understand like the big ideas what's happening? So like the vuln function right here is, it, this is the source code we're looking at. So like when you pass your um, argument vector, like whatever the A's, it gets thrown into that function, which gets called to vuln. And then it takes in this input and then string copy takes the input and copies it into the character buffer. So that's why at first we just start with like 20 A's. So like, hope like, you throw 20 A's into a buffer that's only supposed to have allow 16 characters. Like it should have caused a seg fault, but it didn't because we still have like extra space. And then that's why we look into the register. The other example should do fine. Uh, which example? Oh yeah uh yeah so this is very similar to the, your assignment six but it's not the full answer it's just giving you a basic understand what you're doing like what you're doing is you're using so your buffer space is that i think i guess i think i guess it's right point i should get the memory address um yeah you could also do like this as a vuln as well because you are normally given the source code for these types of challenges but the primary thing you need to do is you need to like, we're trying to overwrite the whole, like the stack frame. And then once you overwrite EIP, you get to control the program. So like once you overwrite that register, the EIP register, you can make it do whatever you want. Like you can make it jump to functions you're not supposed to, like the addresses of functions you're not supposed to, or you can spawn like a shell. Uh, once again, like we're, we are jumping ahead in lecture because is like want to get you guys like, to understand what the basic overflow and advanced overflow is for the assignment. So yeah, you're not procrastinating till the last minute. Did that, I'm sorry, did that answer your question or you're still confused? Oh, cool. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So yeah. So like this character buffer is that buffer space, and it doesn't have to be called like character buffer. It's just any part in code where like you have a blank space that you could throw inputs into. Like hack like hackers just love that. Like, and then string copies is vulnerable because it copies an input into a buffer. But string the reason why str string copy is so vulnerable is because it doesn't sanitize user input. Like. As you get, you saw, we were able to throw 30 A's into this 16, like 
by array or character array, right? Which you like string copy doesn't check for that. And that's why it's kind of important that um, it does. Uh, and another is interesting. Another one is also get. Oops, yeah, get. So like, if you do, if you actually read the manual for get, it actually tells you never to use uh, this function just because it's also just very vulnerable. That's why they changed the f gets. Uh, this is the wrong one. Yeah, so like if you go on Linux, you could actually read the description for like gets, like never use this function. It's very funny. Like it's, it's just like a legacy library function that's still there. Anyways, moving on before I sidetrack too much. Uh, so yeah, so we got the flag. We technically won for this specific challenge, but for your assignment six, you need to overwrite the EIP. So like it takes 32 A's and you see that the EIP is now fully overwritten. So then afterwards, now that you over, you know that it's, probably 32 and might be more or less we have to, you're gonna have to like play around with it you would we can now since we overwrit eip you can now control the program so like you can make it call functions is not supposed to and or and so forth so so some some tips i have for this for basic for rough overflows is the first thing you want to do is cause a seg fault and that's what that challenge just showed you was like if you could cause a seg fault that means that you're able to perform memory corruption like there's some like there's a reason why like nothing stopped you from throwing 30 a's into a 16 character array like don't know why they didn't stop you but you're allowed to so there you go and then next i would actually focus on understanding why the seg fault occurred so like string copy doesn't check the length of the how much characters are um thrown into that buffer and that's why and then finally offset which is the like memory address and overwrite eip and then once you control eip you control the program you can do whatever you want with it so so you guys might have been bored out of your mind and been like whatever we learned in lecture and you're confused of like gabe why did we learn this crap like this thing was back issue in the 70s it's 2020 why like why are we still this is a thing well unfortunately it's actually in the real world and my one of my friends, Joe Gearin, did a talk at CactusCon last December of him hacking security cameras. So these are his slides that I pulled, like partial his slides. So like he did um, Internet of Thing devices. They're very vulnerable. And as you know, like there's smart thermostats, Amazon Echoes, Ring doorbells are a huge one right now. Um, so like they're still th there. So like he targeted this camera company. Uh, and then he just basically shows you like how he found the vulnerabilities. And of course, guess what kind of vulnerabilities they are? Buffer overflows. So there you go. So here's the string copy call and here's a buffer of uh, 28. So that means you can, you have 16 bytes over, right? So that's just one. And he found another. So, and then another. And that was just the U PNP binary. Don't worry too much about that. But basically he was able to just do a, a find and look for all the string copies and in the binary for this camera. And he found over 1800, like it just goes to show like even in 2020 with smart cameras and stuff, like buffer overflows are still a thing. And that's why we're learning it. And, and then all, and then there's like more stuff you could do. Like you can overflow like the file transfer protocol server and get like name port and pass username and passwords. So yeah. Like this is so really relevant. It's pretty cool. And then uh, DEF CON, I think 23, someone posted, did the talk on this where he hacked like 14 IoT devices. So they're still really relevant. And basically that's it for our information session. So like what we went over, GDB, above overflow and why they're still relevant. Um, anyone have any questions? Uh, I hope that wasn't, talk wasn't too broad, but, and I hope it was also helpful for assignment six. Uh, Jacob and I will, I'll be hanging out till for if you guys need help for like assignment six or something as well. Yeah, I can stay too. Uh, I can't, how do I see ch oh, participants? So yeah, okay. Uh, anyways, if you guys are, if you guys think this stuff is cool and like hacking out devices is cool and stuff, uh, check out the two cybersecurity clubs at ASU. There's the Pwn Devils and DevilSec. They do different things. Um, I'll be posting these slides now that I did the presentation. And then these are the sources. So we just did the buffer overflow zero for the Pico CTF. And then here's like an article about how to do a buffer overflow for Windows. 
here's uh, this PowerPoint slide I found from a university that helped explain the stack. And then here's that DEF CON talk I'll talk about, about hacking cameras and smart thermostats and stuff. So I hope you in, thought found our information session useful and we'll be here basically for office hours now if you guys need help with assignment six.